And welcome to episode 47 of the Bash Mania podcast. Before he was winning multiple million dollar paychecks in the PFL, Lance Palmer was a four-time Ohio State champ and four-time All-American at Ohio State. He also won a Big Ten championship, being named Outstanding Wrestler in the process and lost a really close one to Brent Metcalf in the NCAA Finals his senior year. Lance just knows and is wrestling, so I'm really excited to dive into today's conversation. Real quick before I run the intro, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, do so. Apple, Spotify, Google Podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you listen on Apple, please go and leave a five star rating and review. All right. And now today's guest, Lance Palmer. It's Bashomania. Let me tell you something, brother. He gave us everything he had in him tonight. What you going to do when Bashomania runs wild? Oh, it's going to be a good one. And business just picked up here on the podcast. Oh, yeah. You started wrestling when you were, what, nine, right? Yep, How nine did that... years old. It's actually my ninth birthday, which is kind of funny. How did that start? Um, My brother, Colin, he had been wrestling since he was five years old. And at the time, I was doing just traditional American karate. Just like my parents put me in something to kind of have fun. And I was playing baseball and soccer and yep. just doing whatever. And um, I really enjoyed karate at the time. But it was one of those things where it was more of just like a discipline sport where you kind of you do your routines and you go take a test in front of these judges with a routine. And they basically score you. And that's how you get your next belt or your next yep. stripe. And so... I was getting to the point where I was realizing, like, I'm more competitive than this. The The karate aspect of it wasn't as competitive as, like, a taekwondo where you actually go and spar people and win tournaments and things like that. So I basically – my brother did karate for a little while when he was, like, five. And then they were like, he's too rowdy for this. Like, he didn't, <laughs> he wasn't paying attention in there and, like – he like bit his. I, he like kicked his teacher, or bit his teacher, or something <laughs> in first grade or uh, or kindergarten or whatever. So they were like, my dad was just like, I'm gonna put him in wrestling. That'll you know slow him down a little bit, get some of his energy out. So my brother was already wrestling for two or three years, and it was my ninth birthday. My dad bought me a pair of wrestling shoes, and he's like, well, go try it out, see if you like it. And the very first practice, I was like, man, this is awesome. And even though there were the nine-year-olds at my age had already been wrestling for four years, it was like, it gave me something to shoot for. Like, man, if I can yeah. catch up to these guys. And then once I caught up to them, I started, you know, trying to catch up to the state level, then the national level. And it just, it just became something where you're basically keep chasing the next thing and that's still where i'm at today basically and i know you said in that documentary pin which i haven't seen the whole thing but i've seen bits and pieces and there was one thing that stuck out was i think your dad had said something about being um criticized for being too hard on you and you see that a lot like in sports with, with parents who are either maybe too hard on their kids or they live through their kids and it, it seems like it, it kind of worked out and balanced out for you to where it's like your dad seems like your biggest fan. I mean, they were, when we were texting yesterday about the NCAAs being on, you know, it's funny. They showed him in the crowd. I'm like, man, his stamina looks exactly like today after you win something. <laughs> and, and I'm curious, like, did you feel pressure then? Like, it obviously paid off all of, all of his diligence with, with being hard on you. Did you feel like that at the time? Uh, to be honest, I think it would be different if you asked my brother and if you asked me because sure. – my mentality and my drive has always been like self-initiated. Yeah. Um, my dad, we talked, me and my dad just talked about this yesterday or the night before, actually might've been yesterday, but we were in the car and I was driving home from somewhere and we were just talking about the, he, he always knew that if he told me to do something, he didn't have to be right there counting every rep and telling me to do it. I, I would just sure. go and do it. Like there were times where he'd be out of town working with the animals and he'd be like, I want you guys to do your push-ups, pull-ups and sit-ups. I want you to do your airdyne bike after practice, like just little things like that. And I'd be like, all right, that's, that's something that I would do anyway. It just gave me, it gave me more of a, a like reason. Guidance, right. Yeah. Guidance. I was, you know, when you're 11 and 12 years old, you really don't know, 
you know that you're, you know, if you're a disciplined person at that age, which is, I mean, some people are, some people, some people need the guidance, but I knew that that's what it took to get better. And after competing at a national level at like 10 and 11 years old, I knew that that's what I needed to continue to do to get better and, and widen the gap against all the kids that were doing the same types of things. Right. And then, you know, it, it obviously worked being a four time state champ in, in Ohio and, and wrestling in a school like St. Ed, St. Ed's. What led you to Ohio State? Was it just that homegrown choice? Like, I want to stay local. I want to stay home. That was basically what it came down to, because obviously at that point, the team wasn't very, very good. I mean, yeah. I don't remember. I think their highest finish before that was like. 2003 maybe and it was uh, a third place finish when Tommy Rollins was wrestling there yeah uh, I think that was like Tommy Rollins and Mitch no Mitch was already gone he was coaching but that was their last placement in the top three at NCAAs so it wasn't because they had a great team it was right. more of, I wanted to be a pillar to the new program yep. and when I when I committed there Tom Ryan Joe Heskett uh, Lou Roselli those guys weren't coaches there. They were all somewhere. They were all in different places. Like Lou Roselli was still at Edinburgh with Tim Flynn. Um, Heskett, I don't, I don't know if Heskett might have been at Cal Poly still. And then uh, Tom Ryan was at Hofstra. So that was that was a weird. It was a weird scenario because I just put all my belief in obviously myself. I still bet on myself to this day with anything that I do, just because sure. I know myself best. But when it came down to that, it was Jay Jaggers, Jason Johnstone, uh, J.D. Bergman, um, Kirk Nail at the time. Like there was all these guys on the team. And I was like, these guys are all really good wrestlers. They just right. need guidance from a coach who has that fire. And even though Russ Hellickson was a really great coach, he was I think he was just ready to be done coaching. Yep. And that was one thing that I mean, it worked out for us who came in at that time because Right in, I think it was April or May of my senior year, like right when I graduated high school, we found out that they were going to open the portal for us because they were switching coaching and he had resigned and Mitch Clark wasn't going to take over as a head coach and they were going to have a whole new staff. And Tommy Rollins was the only one that stayed on from the old staff. And so I was like, I was like, that's where I want to be. It's two hours from home. Um, I took visits to, I went to Penn state. I actually really liked the coaches there. I liked, um, I liked some of the guys there. Like Dave Rell is one of my good buddies now. And he was there when, uh, that was where he already committed to and Northwestern, like Ryan Lang and Jake Herbert, those guys I was good friends with. Yeah. I liked the coach there at the time, Periano. He was just, he actually coached me in freestyle over the summer for team Ohio so I had connections with all these all these different schools that I really wanted to go to and I really liked, but just the the Ohio born and bred in me, that's what kept me at Ohio State. And just the I wanted to build a tradition here for wrestling because Dustin Schlater was an Ohio guy, C P Schlater was an Ohio guy. You saw all these people going somewhere else and there was a reason for it. So I knew that I knew that the talent was there in Ohio already at Ohio State. We just needed guidance, and Tom Ryan came in and brought Joe Heskett, brought Lou Roselli, and that was, I mean, everything else from there is history. And I feel like ever since, like, Cal, we, we kind of live in a world where everyone wants, you know, they come into college now, and they're like, I want to be a four-time undefeated NCAA champ. And you were a four-time state champ. Like, was that your expectation heading to college? And how did you kind of manage those expectations? Well, my expectations were definitely to be on the podium as a freshman. Yep. I didn't even know if I was going to wrestle as a freshman, to be honest. I went out there and won my wrestle off, and they were like, all right, you're going to start. So I wasn't really sure. <laughs> I didn't really know, like, <laughs> am I going to redshirt this year and uh, and try and improve and get used to the college style or like it was basically, I was put through a Cliff Notes version of a red shirt from October until January, and then in January it just kind of clicked, and I started beating all these guys and started winning matches. And after, I mean, I think I lost like twelve matches in the first half of the season, and then only lost three from Did you January. Did you beat Burroughs that year? 
Yeah, I beat Burroughs. I beat yeah. Burroughs in uh, or no, that was my sophomore year. I beat Burroughs in Vegas. Yeah. Yeah, you had some. You had some awesome wins, and you know it, it's funny because I, I'm look. I was looking when we were talking about you and Metcalf yesterday. I started looking at some different brackets and tournaments. And then somehow, this is why I love the internet. So I'm looking at like different matches of yours, and then it just keeps coming up like Lance Palmer wrestles Bear. How did that come about, dude? <laughs> so it's so it's so funny how that like always comes up. <laughs> right. But, I mean, it was a huge part of our life from since I was born. Really, I mean, my dad and um, we called him my uncle. He was the guy who actually had the exotic animals that my dad was a partner with. Um, they had a, they basically started with one bear in the eighties and it was Caesar, the wrestling bear. They would go to bars, nightclubs, people could pay 20 bucks to wrestle the bear <laughs> and sign a waiver to wrestle the bear at the bar. And if it's you like could tiger bear, King all over again, <laughs> oh, dude, well, the funny part is, is we know doc Ansel really well. Oh, really? Because, yeah. We've known him. I never really knew who, uh, Joe exotic was, but that guy's a legend. <laughs> like, I was, like anything else, like I was, I text my dad cause he still hasn't watched it. I don't even know if he has Netflix or not, but he was, I was telling him about that. And, uh, and he was like, he's like, you know, what's funny is every single person that had exotic animals through the eighties, nineties, before a lot of these laws changed in different States, yeah. they were all very quirky people like that. Super like just super weird. They're type of people who want to, they want the attention, right. and what better way to get attention than to buy a freaking tiger? You're like, hey, look at me. And that's right. kind of – so it makes sense if you were in that world, but if not, you're just like, what is up with this guy? Like, that, that guy's whole story is insane. So did you wrestle a bear before that, like being around animals, or is that just like a – I grew – so when I was born, my dad was already working with the animals. So I used to go in, on shows, like, in my – little baby carrier my dad used to take me around to shows and i would go you know hang out and be around the animals and when they would take breaks because people used to be able to get their pictures taken with bears tigers lions wolves leopards whatever we had at the time people could pay and get their picture taken and it was on like a polaroid and it came with a big thing that had world yeah. animal studios on it and it was um i mean it they did really well and it was really like when everything got shut down, it was really hard on my dad because that was his entire life. Besides us with wrestling, that yeah. was all he had besides that. So, I mean, growing up, that was our every day. We would go with him after school, feed the animals, clean the cages, whatever needed to be done there, and then go to practice and then come home, do our homework, do our workout, stuff like that. And then that was every day for, you know, 20 years of my life. Man, that's wild. And when did that all stop then? Uh, there was a guy in Zanesville, Ohio, who was in prison for something, and his ex-wife was taking care of the animals down there until he got out of prison. And then he thought when he got out of prison that he was going to be able to win her back or something since she stayed to take care of the animals. And sure. when she left, the the story is that he killed himself after letting all the cage doors open. And a bunch of animals got out and there were, you know, leopards and mountain lions and tigers and stuff all over the city or the town. Oh, and was that in the Tiger King documentary? I think they actually talked part about of that. It, yeah, part of it might have been in there where they talked about like, because Jack Hanna is a big uh, guy at the Columbus Zoo and he was, they couldn't get enough darts uh, in time. And so they had to actually kill a lot of the animals, the highway patrol. So it was a big thing that went on during that time. And then the USDA started coming in and telling, basically giving people like us who had um, who had a bunch of animals on the property, basically like, hey, here's a 15-day notice. Whatever animals you don't have replaced into a new living area at that time, we're going to take and do it for you. Wow. So we really didn't have a choice. Nobody really had a choice at that point, except for certain states. Like uh, Doc is in Myrtle Beach, so he's... I mean, he's been there for 30 years or something. Yeah. Wow. So going back to the actual wrestling matches, um, you know, you and Metcalf wrestled a ton, but the time you beat him at Big Tens was kind of interesting because you not only won Outstanding Wrestler of the Tournament, 
you beat him by the largest margin of points in any of your matches. Why do you think that was that you not only were able to beat him, but had the largest point spread between any of your matches? Well, I think there was a lot of things that happened in that match where that I wanted to happen in every other match. And I just, I feel like I had to create some sort of chaos during the match. And in the first period, he had a single leg on me and was basically, I think it took him almost a minute to get the finish on it. And there was a couple times where we were almost out of bounds. There was a couple times where I had almost got my leg free. And I think that created mentally at the at that time, it created a lot of struggle for him and frustration. And even though he got the takedown, I escaped right away. So it was two to one going into the second period. And in the second period, I was riding him, and I actually – I had a power half, and he cried out, and they just stopped it as potentially dangerous instead of giving me – like now they give like a two-point for a cry out even if you don't have him over yet and stuff like that. I mean there's a lot of things that went on during that match that I feel like I was frustrating him and creating opportunities for myself. There was a lot of things that went on during the match like that that were – in my favor because I knew I could out scramble him if it came to it sure. but it was more of just creating the opportunity because every other match that I had with him I just wrestled him straight on and that's when he's really good is if you just wrestle him straight on and don't create any type of scramble or flurry you're you're really just playing into his game and yeah. we saw it with Caldwell Caldwell just went out and made it a crazy match and frustrated him and that's kind of what I knew I had to do and um, and that's how I created those opportunities. And even with the last, the last scramble, I just created a position that he was uncomfortable in and, and we were both just trying to get the, get the score. And he held on, he held on so long that I was able to get the back points on top of it. But at that point, I mean, at that point it was just the takedown won it. I think it was, um, it was three to two or three to three going into that, and the takedown was going to win. So we were both just holding on for dear life, trying to get it. And then going into the NCAA finals, you know, your senior year, you had said that the success leading up to it, like when they did the press conference after I think the semis, you were saying that you think all the success you were having was coming from confidence and mentality. What do you think helped give you that confidence and? maintaining a proper mindset i'm sure beating metcalf at the big tens helped but it seemed more than that like you were kind of saying it seemed like you know even if in that period of time everything was going your way but you you don't get that confidence overnight like you built that up for a while what kind of led to that confidence and that mentality my biggest thing in college was just putting it together and stringing it together and knowing that i can beat these guys over and over again because i mean not to not to make it seem like an excuse, but I felt that my weight class was probably the toughest weight class in NCAA. Like sure. probably all four years that I was there, if not at least three. So it was, I never wanted to go away from that. I always wanted the challenge head on. And I had pins against Dustin Schlater. I had wins against uh, Josh Chirella. I beat Burroughs. Um, I beat Jenkins too. Jenkins. Yep. Exactly. Like, all those guys, like I have wins over all these national champs and it's just the confidence was there, but it wasn't, it, there were times where I would lose a match to a guy like that and be like, man, and, and it would really, it would be a, a roller coaster really. And I'm, I'm really mentally strong, but when you go through a six month straight grind for one season and in the big 10 and in one of the toughest weight classes in history, that was, um, I mean, it wears on you mentally a little bit. So I think the confidence was built up over the last four years of that and knowing that this is gonna, this is my last shot at it. And it seems like you did a good job of, of you know, managing the highs and lows. Like, it, it's always funny. I hate how some of the media, like, tries to almost create a story that isn't there. Like, there, there's a solid story there, but it's like, I remember you said probably, like, no less than seven times, I have no hate for Metcalf. If you yeah. want to call it a rivalry, it's friendly. So it's clear there that you kind of maintain that proper perspective. But did you always have that? Like, was that your mentality through even high school? Like, you, you seem to balance the highs and the lows really well. Yeah, I think I do. I, I, had, a, I had a match my sophomore year in the district finals. So in Ohio, the district is right before state. Yep. 
And I lost to a guy like two to one or one to zero or something off of a weird blood time call where they gave him a point. I lost the match or in overtime. It was really strange. It was it was like a bad dream, honestly. But I can imagine. that guy, yeah, and he was a he was a senior and I was a sophomore. So I was going into my state tournament my sophomore year off of that loss in the finals at districts and. I had a coach in high school named Jeff Leonard, and I just FaceTimed with him the other day. He's like, he was always outside of my, my dad, who's like always been my biggest fan and everything else. Jeff Leonard was always the, the voice in my head all the time in high school. He was always like the clear mind. If, if I was getting crazy or getting, if just, he was always there for me, you know, almost as a father figure, but kind of the one where like, like the cool uncle, if your dad's being an, if your dad's being a dick, like he's yeah. the one to go to. And that was kind of like Jeff Leonard. He's still like that today. But um, he pulled me aside after that match and was like, you know, next week we're next week, make some adjustments. We'll go, we'll go out there. We're going to win our second state title. And like, like nothing was like, nothing was wrong. I mean, he had coach guys like Ryan Lang, Mason Lenhart, Gray Maynard, like, he sure. knew he just knew what he had to say to me at that time and to kind of level me out because I was like I was freaking out. I was a returning state champ. I just lost to a senior who nobody had any clue of. Yeah. And then we get to the state finals the next week and I'm beating the kid eight nothing in the first period and I pinned him. And I was just like, I don't even know why that match was that close last week. It never even should have been. Right. <laughs> and it was like stuff like that is just Sometimes you need an outside force to mentally stabilize you a little bit. And I feel like I have those to this day. I have all sure. those people in my life and even you could be as mentally strong as you want and try and keep a level head at all times, but you still need those people from the outside to, to be able to just talk to them. You could talk to somebody for five minutes on a phone call and be like, man, I needed that. I feel a lot better about what's going on right now. Was that how it was like at Ohio State too? Like I know when Joey went there, he he told me he's like one of the biggest things for him was he kind of got his head on straight when he left Stanford and went to Ohio State. Like was that kind of the, the the vibe there? Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I was I was probably like a problem child for Tom, <laughs> and uh, I, like I did like to party and I did like to to do my thing outside of practice and outside of school, but. I knew when to turn it on and off and when to get the job done. And um, I was just talking with Lou Roselli's wife last night or the night before. We were on a group text with my brother and I and her just talking about a funny story about um, it was my freshman year and all the guys were like hiding in the corners is what Lou said. And, and I was like, Lou, I'll go with you. And um, I was on top of Lou and I had both legs in and I was like, bending him backwards, flattening him out. And he just reached back and taps. He's like, you got to get off of me, man. I, like, <laughs> like, I can't wrestle you anymore. And he was telling Amy this, and we she t messaged us the other night, and I was just dying laughing. I'm like, that's what was so funny about Lou, is Lou was straightforward with you no matter what. Like, if you were, excuse my language, but if you, he's like, if you're a pussy, I'm going to tell you you're a pussy. Like, he was never going to cut corners and say things that weren't, uh, weren't true just to feed your ego. Lou was the guy who he would tell people like it is. And um, I feel like even though Lou wasn't there for the end of McKenna's career, I think that Lou had that impact on a lot of guys. Sure. Like Jay Jaggers was one of them. I mean, Lou knew how to get through to Jaggers. And obviously it worked for Jay and he won two national titles. But um, it's the same thing with Logan Stever. Lou Roselli, he was the guy... You know, I think that's just you need somebody like that to kind of like if Joey said that, get your head on straight. You need you only need one person to help you find your way. Right. And sometimes it just it matches up that way. The universe will put somebody in your life that you need. And then, you know, you didn't wrestle after college. You, you kind of knew you were going the MMA route. When did that MMA itch really start? Man, I had. My sophomore year of college, this this is kind of when the itch first started. I had just finished a tough practice in the wrestling room. I think they had Uriah Faber doing a 
a photo shoot in the room after practice for like cage fighter gear back in the day, Mike DeSabato's brand. Yep. And uh, Mark Coleman was in there with him and just like talking and BSing with him. And he was, he literally was like, was like, man, Palmer's intensity, Palmer's wrestling style, this and that, like just talking like Mark does and telling Faber that like, this is the guy you need to recruit next. And it was right after he had recruited uh, Mendez right off of his uh, finals match with Jaggers. And so it was like, Faber would text me here and there my junior and senior year, like, hey, man, what's going on? Like, still uh, still watching your career and following closely. would like to get you out here to California after. And we just kind of talked here and there, nothing really serious. But I I thought that it was something I wanted to do just because – I felt that the opportunity for a long-term career was longer than me continuing to wrestle. Yeah. And the at that point, I was never really somebody who really – I never really loved freestyle wrestling. Yeah. And I was decent at it. I mean, I won, I won a triple crown for USA Wrestling with Freestyle Greco and Folk Style. Um, I placed at Fargo without even training – I would never even train in the spring. Or I would just qualify at the state tournament. Like my senior year, I qualified at 160 and then wrestled 140 at Fargo. So <laughs> I was like, I never really trained for Fargo, which sure. is, it's stupid to look back at, but I did so well without even, like I had all techs and pins. I think I teched JP O'Connor in like 30 seconds the one year. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it just like, I was talented at, at freestyle. I just didn't enjoy it. But like, College wrestling and folk style wrestling, that's what I, that was my bread and butter. That's what I enjoyed. So I really knew that freestyle wasn't, I wasn't going to be wholeheartedly in it, even if I was good enough to make a world or Olympic team, which I, I feel that I could have, but that was why. And it seems like all the decisions you made kind of paid off with the route you went in MMA. I mean, you won $2 million paychecks in the past couple of years in the PFL. What kind of led to those decisions? Was it was it somebody like Uriah helping you kind of guide you? Like, did you ever want to go to the UFC? Like, what's kind of been the decision maker in those in that journey that's led you to what now going to your third season here with the PFL? Well, I think a lot of it is just, um, it's hard because there was there's a lot of struggle throughout the entire process. Like with anything, there's a struggle. Sure. And it may not be, sometimes it's a financial struggle, sometimes it's mental struggle, sometimes it's relationships. There's a lot of different things that go on through the process of it, but I feel like I did a really good job of being able to navigate everything the way I wanted it to be done. I wasn't just going to sit around and wait for the call for the UFC. Um, I mean, I could have done that. I was 7-0 and after I won the RFA belt on a regional show and that at the time was the biggest feeder for the UFC and they hadn't called me and I was only seven and oh they wanted me to win some more fights then World Series of Fighting called me to fight on four weeks notice or three weeks notice against a guy who was really tough but they were going to offer me way more money than I had ever made from fighting or anything else in my life and I was like let's do it I think I can beat this guy like I have never turned down a fight from anybody So that was kind of, there was, I mean, there's a lot of my teammates in California, they just waited and waited and wanted to be in the UFC and, and like that was their main focus was that, but for me is to create a future for my future family and my wife now and myself and the way things just worked out and the way that I had a vision for what I wanted to do and what I wanted to accomplish is there. Don't get me wrong. The UFC is still the pinnacle of MMA. That is what that's what people want to be the champ of. And maybe if I get to this point where I win a third million dollar tournament or a fourth million dollar tournament and before I want to retire from fighting, if the UFC wants to offer what I feel I'm worth, yep. then I would love to go over there and compete against the best guys that they have to offer. But I get a lot of crap for it because they people think that I choose to stay over here because it's easy. Really, it's not easy. You have to fight five times in seven months. 
against tough guys that people don't even know. And that's the hardest part. You could be fighting a guy who could be a superstar if the UFC trains behind him, pushing him in the media, but you're fighting a guy who nobody knows about. That's even harder than fighting somebody like a Holloway or Alex Volkanovsky sure. or you know anybody in the top five at 145 who I think I can compete just fine with. I've trained with the top 145ers in the world for the last nine years of my life, and I've done plenty fine with all of them. So it's it's more of a financial decision for my future because I can honestly look at my my teammates or ex teammates and guys that I'm friends with who are in the UFC at my weight class and I'm completely content with being set for my future right now. Yeah. By the way, where did you come up with the name The Party? Well, they always say that you can't give yourself your own nickname. So right. <laughs> basically, basically I had a, had a story from college. It was like the very first. So the ver, the very first day, you have like the all athlete meeting, like in an auditorium. Yeah. So for Ohio State, it was like Gene Smith and all the coaches and everybody and all the athletes. We have like nine hundred athletes at Ohio State, and there was a big auditorium room. But the door, you either can go in down low, like where the professor would be talking, or you can go in the back up high. And I was running late, and I came in the front, like the front of the auditorium, and I was just standing in front of everybody, and it had already started, obviously, so everyone looks at me, and I was just like, I'm here for the gangbang. And then, <laughs> like, the whole place started laughing, but uh, Tom Ryan just was staring at me, shaking his head. Like, this was the very first, like, public thing we had to do <laughs> for Ohio State my freshman year, and that was my introduction. And somehow Matt Brown heard about it, from from somebody maybe like Tommy Rollins or something and then it trickled down to Uriah Faber that he had heard it from Matt Brown they were just like talking about me one time and that story came up and that's how I got the nickname the party <laughs> was just because of that when I first went to OSU <laughs> I was always wondering that because I'm like you know we've been following each other on social for years and I never see you party like I, I see you let loose and have fun but you're not one yeah. to like all out party like you're you're training and getting after it so and speaking of that like getting a million dollar check not even once but twice you know so many great D1 wrestlers, NCAA champions or not, they don't get that opportunity to make really good money. They start making coaching or they leave the sport, maybe go into business, but even business, it, it, it's hard to get to that level. What was it like when, when you started getting that money in? Um, It was more of just a relief that we were able to put money away and be able to be able to secure our future. Yep. Like, especially during this time, you look at the, the stuff going on with coronavirus right now, and there's families that they live week to week off their weekly check, and and it's it's hard to see, and it's sad. I mean, even my own parents, like my own parents don't make a lot of money. I didn't come from money. We came mm -hmm. from going door to door selling candy bars to be able to raise money to go to national tournaments. There was never like... We had we had dirt bikes and toys and fun stuff, but that was because my parents worked their butts off to be able to have that for us. And um, so it's it's hard to watch that because I came from that. I came from the. I mean, when I was when I was an only child, when I was a little kid, my parents would have to save money throughout the week just to have a pizza night on Friday nights. Like that's just where I came from. So to be in the position I'm in right now, I feel truly blessed but I also have put in so much work and effort and discipline and sacrificed a lot of things in my life that I wanted to do to get to this point yep. that now I mean I really I have zero regrets for where I'm at but it took a long time to be able to get to this spot and one of the things that you and I constantly text about is home gym equipment you know, your, your gym is in the basement. I, I love, and that's what like now I'm finally starting to, to get some equipment. And I love the, you put up an Instagram story the other day, you were sitting in, in the sauna and you said like, you got to invest in yourself. Right. And, and that's what you've done. And I'm curious on your perspective on investing in yourself and how long you've been doing that for, because you, you know, you have your toys, but you, you by no means look like someone who 
is making million dollar paycheck after million dollar paycheck. You've been kind of wise. And it's easy for some people to say, well, yeah, if I got a million dollars, I'd build a home gym too. But you've been investing in yourself for a while. Like when did that process kind of start of investing in yourself? Well, I mean, that's, that's actually a saying that I've heard from my own dad before. And I think it's like a lot of people, it's easy for somebody to say that to a person like me, like, yeah, if I had that, I'd do this. Like, well, I've worked tirelessly for years and years and worked through having no money and like mowing lawns and doing private lessons just to be able to maybe pay all my bills when I first started fighting. Right. Like it's it's gotten to a point where once you once you get a taste of it, you never want to have to go back to where you were at. Yeah. You always want to remember it, but you never want to you never want to sit on your laurels and be like, yeah, I think we, you know, I think we did everything we needed to do. I think we're just going to chill. Right. <laughs> like I've never, I've never been like that. Like my mind is always racing. And even my wife is, she just like, sometimes she just like looks at me like this guy's an idiot. Like I'm always well, thinking. I of- love it because like, dude, I saw you started a landscape company. I'm like, here, this guy just won a, won a, a, a fighting tournament where he got a million dollar paycheck at the end. And here he is advertising for landscape jobs and plowing and will will take up your patio. Like, man, you don't see that often. Most people, like you said, will sit on their laurels and be like, man, I'm good. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, what kind of gave you that edge to to have that perspective of, you know, money does change so many people. And it doesn't for make sure. a lot of people go back to work. Like, what kind of gave you that foundation to where it's like, okay, good, I can maybe buy this car or put some money away, but it's time to go back to work. And not even just with fighting. Like, you're starting yeah. landscape companies. Like, what kind of gave you that foundation to want to do that? I think I've always just wanted to learn. I've always wanted to get better. I've always wanted to improve. And even with – even in fighting, winning – I mean, it's the same in wrestling, No, Like, winning one state title is nice, but winning two is better. Mm-hmm. Winning two is cool, but winning three is better. Like, there's always more. Yep. And it's, I mean, I don't know if that's a good way to think or not, but that's the way I've always thought. Like I can do more, I can be better. I can win more. I can do more. Like I've always been that way. And if I can, if there's a way that I can get that out there, it's always just, it's always for me to just do it. There's only one way you can really show somebody. There's so many people out there that'll talk about motivating and talk about this, but they're just talking the people that it, you got to really follow the people that are actually doing it. Right. And that's why you don't see me talking trash on social media about guys I fight. You don't see me. I'm out there just doing it. Yeah. Like that's, that's the easiest way to shut people up is just do it. Yeah. And I've always felt like I had something to prove because even in high school, the, the forums online, people would be talking trash about the way that my dad brought us up, the way we trained, the way we put, we got pushed too hard. It's like, now what are they saying? They always right. have to find another excuse of why somebody's successful instead of just applauding the fact that they're successful because of their hard work and their effort they put in. Right. So I, I think it's, that's always been the mentality. It's never been, it's never been a mentality to do it for other people. It's always been internal. Like I want to do it for me and I want to be successful for me. I don't want to be successful for anyone else. But when it comes down to it, there's always the driving forces that are outside forces. And that's kind of how I got that, that drive a little bit more is just like people who say you can't do it or think you can't do it. Like there's people who are like, Oh man, you get smashed in the UFC. That stuff drives me. Like even though even though I'm not in the UFC right now, it drives me because if I do get that opportunity to where I want to switch over and sign with them and make a run at the title, then what happens if I win the belt? Then what's the excuse? Right. <laughs> That's the thing. Like there's always an excuse for people to make, but you just have to drown out the negativity and use some of it for motivation, but drown some of it out. And that's kind of where we go back to investing in yourself is you trust yourself more than anyone else. Yep. Like I know the decisions that I make, if it's a bad decision, I can own it. I can own up to it. If it's a good decision, then I can work off of it and build off of it. But I've been investing in myself with the very first push up I did in my parents' bedroom when I was nine years old yep. to the point now where the investments are turning into 
financial investments and things like that, but it's still investing in myself for my future, my future kids, my wife, you know, if something happens and I'm not here anymore, that they're, they're going to be fine. So I think it, you never really think of that stuff until you get to a point where you can start to do that, where you can start to invest in yourself a little bit financially. And my, my gym in the basement is what I do on a daily basis except we were paying a membership to go to a gym. Yep. Why not have, I mean, why not have everything I need? If I am able to do it financially, why not do it? Because that, that equipment's going to last a lot longer than the price I pay to put it in there. And we've talked about that a bunch. Like it doesn't have to be top of the line equipment. It can be whatever, whatever somebody can afford to help them improve and not have to go to a gym every day. And you can wake up throw some clothes on, go down in the basement, jump on the treadmill, get a run in, sit in the sauna, lift some weights. Like that's, that's what I've always liked to do. I've been working out with my dad since I was a little kid. So it's like, for me, that never felt like I was being pushed. I enjoyed doing it. It's even the same thing for me. Like I go to a really nice gym across town that has sauna, steam room. It, it, they redo everything almost like every other year where it's all new equipment. And it's nice. It's like yeah. 300 bucks a month, and it's like, you know what? I meet people here. It's good for business, but it's getting to the point now where it's like it's a 25-minute drive each way. I don't have time yeah. for that. I'd rather yeah. save that money, get that extra 45 minutes a day, and slowly get equipment. And yeah. you know, I don't even care to talk to people about it who don't kind of have that same mentality because they're so quick to say, you're going to spend $3,000 on a bike or $4,000 <laughs> on a treadmill. And, you know, I'll use this analogy since you're a car guy. It's like somebody can say, well, I'm, I, I would never buy the Peloton treadmill for five grand, but you just spent six grand on rims. You know what I mean? Like, it's all about what's important to you. And it's like, I think health is so important. And I definitely like as I start to get equipment, I want to make sure I don't get into that mentality where it's like there's kids who won't do that first push up because they're like, well, when I have the home gym, then I'll start working out. Like, even yeah. now, as I start to get equipment, I catch myself wanting to say sometimes I'll do that once the dumbbells come in. I'll do that once I get this, right? And it's like yeah. maintaining that perspective. And I'm curious now that you've had the success. You've had success in the last 20-plus years of, of combat sports between wrestling and MMA. You're starting to dabble in more and more in business. What's your perspective here moving forward when you've had a lot of success? And like you said, there's there's not – it's a balance. You're not greedy in saying – I need more money. I need more money. This isn't enough. But at the same time, you do want to be diligent with what you have. And you don't mm -hmm. want to sit around and, and then wait for something to happen or miss opportunities. Like, what's your perspective on kind of balancing that right now? I think, like I said earlier, the, the biggest thing for me is always wanting to do more. Yeah. I feel like I haven't accomplished what I want to accomplish yet. Yeah. And going into the first season of PFL was like – I was focused on winning just the first fight of the season, let alone getting through five fights and winning that first that first season of it. Yeah. So now that I've done it twice, I'm at a point where I feel that they're bringing in better guys, they're bringing in new opponents, they're they're trying to bring in people to push me and make me better, and I feel like I'm getting better every time I step in the gym still. Sure. So it's, that's the, the motivation I have is just to keep improving and keep winning fights and keep just keep doing what I feel I'm really good at doing. And that's just improving in the gym. And I'm still not where I want to be. I think once you get to a point where, like even in wrestling, I wasn't where I wanted to be 100% going into my very last match of my college career. Sure. I was probably, I was probably the best I was going to be for that time period. Yeah. And yep. I feel like I could have got a lot better at wrestling even after that. But that's how I feel right now for MMA. I feel that there's such a big window for me to improve as long as my health holds up and I don't have a lot of outstanding injuries and things that'll slow me down. Sure. I feel like, I, could, I mean, I feel like I can still have a few good years left and still be able to compete and improve. I think the improvements are where I'm I'm so hooked on always doing better, doing more, getting better at things. Like I've been doing my own stocks for like the last year and index funds and things like that. Like I knew nothing about that a year ago. Yep. And now I like I'll just look at different stocks and just check things, especially right now 
with the market being so volatile right now, it's like, yeah, there's so many, like you can look at all these things and not really know, like, I still don't know a lot. Like I would never do day trading cause I don't know how to do day trading. I just put, you know, I put money in for the long, the long haul and, and see how it does. And it's, it's fun to watch, but it's like, Stuff like that, I never, never even thought about looking at the stock market or thought about a Vanguard account before last year. And now, like that, has opened my eyes to more things like real estate. And I want to get into more real estate here in the near future and keep building, just keep building my business brand because my my athlete brand is always going to keep building as I fight more and as I get better and and just whatever happens in the next few years, if I do try to get into the UFC or if I, you know, whatever happens there, that's always, that brand's always going to be there. The athlete brand, but the the business brand is what I'm working on building up now at the same time. And I also feel like a lot of athletes don't do a good job of that, which is t pulling from that relevance pool and putting it into a business stock, right? Like mm -hmm. you see it with, I, I won't say who, but I had a chat with the, the guy who's in finance and wrestling and, and Olympics or and towards the Olympic trials. And I had told them, like, listen, even whether you think you're going to win the Olympics or not, you have a you have a career in finance for the next 30 years. Now's mm -hmm. the time to take the relevance from wrestling while you're more relevant than you're ever going to be and put that in here because otherwise you miss that opportunity. And I understand yeah. the people who can't do it. If you can only focus on wrestling or competing in whatever sport you're in i understand that but if you do have the capacity like you see now with guys like david taylor who are like hey while i'm competing i'm going to be super active on social i'm going to build the gym i'm going to build a club like and i think if you have that relevance it only continues to kind of domino because if you pull more of your from your relevance now and have this kind of business portfolio and let's say you do decide to want to go on a bigger stage like the ufc and then now if you have everything pulled up, you can capture that relevance easier. And that's yeah. the one thing that always drives me nuts when when athletes are like, you know, I'm just going to win and then that'll be my relevance. Yeah, but if if that's what you're if that's what you want to do, fine. But if you mm. think that's gonna, that little bit of relevance, especially like in wrestling, MMA, it's not the NFL. It's not where yeah. it's the household name and everybody's going to be buying your jerseys. That window's very short and you see like especially with the UFC you see how short somebody's relevance can be where like Ronda Rousey's the face. She gets knocked out. She's done. John Jones is the face. He gets in trouble. He's done. And now like if you weren't set up to capture that relevance, you missed out on opportunities. And I feel bad for guys that aren't capturing that relevance. It's like these guys come out of college and it's like, especially with wrestling, if you're, great in college wrestling your relevance is typically like this it's just a downward trajectory and if you're not if you're not trying to pull from that i feel like you miss out well i feel like and that i'll use i'll use logan steber as an example just because we've been so close our entire lives and grew up yeah. together pretty much with wrestling but you even see it where he stops competing and it's only been, I don't know, what, six months or a year since he announced that. And it's like, what's Logan Stever doing? Like, yeah. nobody really knows because you're, everybody's so focused on who's next or who's now. Yeah. Or, like, you know, guys like Yanni or, you know, somebody who's competing right now. And even that happened to me when I stopped wrestling yeah. is people are like, oh, yeah, you used to wrestle at Ohio State. It's like, right. Yeah, did. Yeah, I was pretty good. Right. <laughs> but people don't really only there's only a small group of people who are like, like diehard wrestling fanatics that'll really like guys like Tony Ramos. They're like, oh, yeah, that's Tony Ramos. He did this. He wrestled sure. this guy. Like if you're not still competing, you're not really going to be able to take those people over into what you're doing next unless you start it right now while you're still competing and you take that group of people. And then when you move into your next venture, like I've had so many people hit me up about the plowing and landscaping and the patios, just because they see that I live in Columbus and they see, they watch my social media, they watch my fights or whatever. Yeah. We have people walk on the walk path behind our house. They're asking my wife, like who built the deck? Who did this? Like, <laughs> it's like little things like that is all, 
that's how you can build yourself up. If, if you wait until you're ready, it's too late. You have to do it while you're doing the thing before that. And it takes, it takes, you got to be able to strategize. Like my buddy who has the souped up Duramax diesel truck started a YouTube channel and he, his full-time job is a mortgage broker. I'm like, dude, everybody, all these truck enthusiasts, they'd be probably buying new houses if they knew you did mortgages, right? But it takes that, yeah. how do you strategically implement mortgages in an automobile enthusiast YouTube? Like, it does take brain power. It's not the easiest oh, thing yeah. that everybody can do, like helping people strategize. So it's definitely something that, look, it's not for everyone. And much like success, it's just a different vertical of success where you're, you're you know, you're doing it where you're trying to strategize, how can I capture from this relevance I have? And build, if I never get any more relevance, let me have as much help from that as I can. Or if I do get more opportunities to have a bigger platform to pull from. Exactly. So last question here before I let you go. You know, it's the one thing that's always interesting about successful wrestlers who then go into other areas of life is it's hit or miss on whether or not they ever get back involved in wrestling to any capacity. Do you stay involved at all with wrestling right now? Or are you just really um, focused on training in the business? As far as like coaching and things like that, I don't really, I don't really stay involved. Like last year, there was a kid named Connor Brady who was a senior in high school, and he's at Virginia Tech now. I was working with him a good amount from like January through April, yep. through his state tournament run and stuff like that. But um, at this point, there's really not any high school kids that I work with because I have mats in my basement and stuff. I was doing privates down there when I had time or when I was home. Um, I'll go in and, and wrestle with some of the guys at OSU sometimes when I'm in town and, uh, and you know, do one-on-ones and work with them sometimes or could just go to a practice and wrestle with those guys. Like if I come home during a weekend when I'm in fight camp, I'll do that. And Tom's been really really cool about me coming in the room and helping out here and there. Cause I know they crack down on a lot of the NCAA rules where you only can go 12 times in a season. If you're an alumni and like you have to, to be able to be part of the RTC program, you have to have competed within a certain amount of years in wrestling. So it's like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that go on with that, but even Rutgers, like I'll go wrestle with the guys at Rutgers and Reese is over there and yeah. uh, he's doing a great job with their RTC program and they have Ashnault over there and all those guys. So it's like I still am involved in wrestling and I still love the sport, but I can't give like I, w I would love nothing more to be able to coach wrestling at the college level once I'm done fighting. Sure. But our roots are in Columbus, Ohio. So if it's nowhere in Columbus, Ohio, yeah. <laughs> I'm not you know, yeah. like it, it, it doesn't make sense for us to up and leave just for, you know, just to coach at a different place. So I'm kind of in that scenario right now where I'm helping out where I can going into going into wrestle. And obviously it helps me too, because yeah. getting in wrestling shape for a fight is the best shape you can be in. So the guys at Rutgers love when me and Frankie and a couple of the other guys come in there and wrestle with their guys and, um, you know, being able to go in and compete with them and kind of test yourself because they're, they're the young guys and, and we're the old guys, but we're still, you know, we're still competing at the highest level you can compete at. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, listen, thanks for, for taking some time. I'm very envious of the trophy case behind you, by the way. I was just telling my wife before we get on here, like, I want to, I got this Bash Mania sign. I got to hang. I got, I want to put like some cool, like, shelves here. I think I want to put like some WWF action figures and stuff. I'm like, man, I was literally just saying that an hour ago here. And I, I can't top that. <laughs> you know where I got this? I got this at Ikea like five years ago. Really? Yeah, I got it at Ikea. My newest ones I just put up on the wall here, but yeah, that's sick. I, I, I like the stand. I really do like the yeah, stand. I like that a lot. It, that was like something you can mount sideways yeah. shelving. Like if you could mount a glass thing on the wall sideways, I think that would be awesome. Yeah. But yeah, man, it's and, cool. and you're going to have more of those, I'm sure. This isn't the end. <laughs> I hope so. Well, yeah. when I got the when I got the one last year, it just sat on top of that shelf. <laughs> I remember and that. And this year, I was like, I need to put these up with the check. Frame. So that's a good I, problem to have. We got more walls over here. We got more walls in other rooms. <laughs> just like yeah, you got space. We'll, we'll put them where we can fit them. And then all my wife's trophies and medals, we still got to hang those up. But 
now that we're in quarantine, we got plenty of time to do it. <laughs> that, that's what's happened here. Just a little while ago, I was talking about the fact that we do have so much time. Like, I want to paint. I want to hang some shelves. That's what led to the, the whole thing over here. So, oh yeah, that that'd be a cool background. You can have a bunch of different stuff over there. Stuff that we could send in, like people that you do so, the. Like I got, I don't know if you can see it on top of the gun safe. Which, by oh way, yeah, the, the gun itself would be cool. But like, you know, there's like some <laughs> old school WWF shirts, and um, I have like Jerry Briscoe from the WWF was on the podcast, so I happen to pick up his oh. action figure. Figure if I start from WWF guys, I'll have them like behind me. So, heck yeah, that's sweet. Might have to start like putting it. the guns on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> heck yeah, you got to have at least one up there just during the show, at least. Right, exactly. So, all right, <laughs> sweet man, listen, enjoy the rest of your day, and thanks for taking the time to come by. Thanks, man. I enjoyed it. I'll talk to you soon. And that is it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, shoot me a message, DM me, email me, leave a message on the website, leave a five-star rating review on Apple Podcasts or Facebook, wherever you can. It all helps. So be sure to subscribe, and I'll be back with another episode shortly. And the beat goes on. 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 Bond. Bond.